Welcome everyone. It's good to see lots of familiar faces. Uh, today I'm very honored for many reasons, but uh, it's great to be in SOAS for the Illicit Economies, Violence and Development Seminar Series at CIVAD, uh, the Center for the Study of Illicit Economy, Violence and Development. Uh, it is a great honor to be at SOAS for many reasons, but I'll just start with an anecdote. Uh, 12 years ago, I was um, a, one of these, you know, sort of Italian migrants in London working at Cafe Nero, uh, and that's all what I did. Uh, and I came to this room, actually, for the first time, and it was, I think, Shirin Ebadi's uh, lecture about human rights in Iran at the time. And, uh, you know, I had, in my life, I would have never thought to be chairing an event, an event which I think is actually important uh, for many reasons, but also for the reasons that I'm chairing it, I'd say, <laughs> for me. Uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 really, it's really sort of quite oniric experience for me to actually be chairing this event. And uh, even before starting, I would like just to express my personal individual solidarity with all those affected in Iran at the moment by the, by the repression and violence uh, that uh, protesters have been experiencing. And, uh, and it's... Uh, I think as an Iranian, it's very difficult to be distant, but uh, in a way, there is this force in the hope that sort of uh, we share with them. Um, seminar series is, has had already two events, I think a very, two very high caliber events, the f and, but this is the first in-person one. So in a way, uh, you know, it's also good to see that life is returning to, you know, sort of its normal, normal way of doing things. Uh, the previous ones, uh, and I think you can also access information online on the website, were with Jenny Pierce, uh, I think the last one, and the, the first one was with Dolly Keegan and Michael Watts, uh, respectively from the University of Melbourne and UCLA. Uh, it, the series really covers a lot of ground, uh, Everything that more or less uh, sort of touches upon questions of illicit economies and uh, from smuggling to human trafficking to terrorism and the connection, of course, with organized crime and, of course, with drugs, which is the subject of today's seminar. Uh, the seminar is, of course, part of uh, uh, the activities of a new center, uh, CIVAD, uh, which I mentioned, which is the legacy of the Drugs and Disorder uh, Project funded by GCR, uh, JCRF and ESRC uh, at SOAS, and uh, part of a project led by uh, the one and only Jonathan Goodhand at SOAS, uh, and of which uh, many members of the Special Issue Collection uh, were part, not all of them, but myself, was a, I was a postdoctoral researcher then, Francis, who's speaking today, was also, and many others. And you can, you can actually uh, track that on the website of uh, the project, which is drugsanddisorder.com, I think. But you know, Drugs and Disorder, Google can do a good job. Just Google it. <laughs> um, the project, the, this, the project at, uh, sort of that sort of has built the legacy for the center, CIVAD, uh, ask the question of how can war economies be transformed into peace economies? And in a way, with this question in mind, uh, we, we started thinking about our own special issue. Uh, the special issue is about the everyday. Well, that's quite a generic thing to, to do. But it's also quite new when you come to the study of drugs. Uh, drugs have been known to be, uh, you know, of course, a subject of quite sensationalist coverage, uh, you know, from, of course, you know, Netflix series in which, uh, you know, every single moment connected to the drug economy is exciting, adventurous, violent, uh, to be uh, only the site of violence or, you know, or underdevelopment. Well, in a way, by asking the question of uh, the everyday, by sort of situating the question of drugs uh, on the everyday, we are trying to see it beyond, beyond this sensationalist frame. And this has implications, of course, for the understanding of drugs in the world generally, but also for policy, which I think is one of the objectives that this seminar series has as well. Uh, uh, the special issue, uh, which uh, after some sort of 
internal pressure was launched today. It's, <laughs> it's part of, uh, it's the latest uh, special issue by Third World Quarterly, uh, the everyday life of drugs, uh, consumers, dealers, producers, and enforcers. In a way, uh, and, and I'm the guest editor, and I should have introduced myself, I guess. Uh, so it's like, uh, I'm Mazir Gyavi. I'm a senior lecturer at the, at the, at the University of Exeter. Uh, the, 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 and it, it sort of looks at these four categories. Of course, the categories sort of are not so distinct when you look at the real world. Consumers can be also dealers out of economic need. Dealers can be very close to producers when they change job or when season changes, of course, from the sort of crop moment of uh, drug production to the actual trafficking and trading of it. Uh, and, uh, well, enforcers can be involved in trading, but that's not something we, have, you know, sort of actually cover in the special issue. But we cover a lot of ground. Uh, there are 10 contribu contributions uh, which uh, cover, uh, uh, I think, all, all basically most of the regions of the global south, Latin America, the Caribbean, cases from Africa, Central Asia and, and uh, Southeast Asia. So we have contributions uh, on Colombia covering three different borderlands uh, in, the, in the Colombian region. Uh, we have contribution from uh, um, Kenya by Neil. Uh, we have contributions about Central Asia, mostly on Afghanistan, actually three contributions. And then we have a contribution by Patrick Meehan uh, on Myanmar. Patrick Meehan and colleagues, who's also in the room, actually. Uh, so let me, I think I have two or three minutes still to, to continue. Uh, I'll just say what I, was the idea behind this category of the everyday, and then I'll move in introducing the, the speakers and sort of leaving the floor for the actual sort of important part of this seminar series. Seminar. Uh, when I thought about the everyday, uh, I, I had in mind not the sort of uh, uh, philosophical school of thought which you know, was concerned with uh, uh, objective ontological reality of drugs. What I had in mind was a bit more uh, 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 something, uh, I think a bit more fluid, which was influenced by the idea that Bertolt Brecht for instance, in his theater, and uh, the Italian filmmaker and poet Paolo Pasolini had in mind when they tried to portray reality. In a way, it really the, the, the sort of inspiration came from good fiction as opposed to sort of sensationalist fiction. And in a way, uh, fiction was also the way that I thought might be a very good way to portray actual drug realities when we cannot have access to every moment of the everyday. And we were inspired, all of us, in a way, by novels, uh, you know, from Amitav Ghosh book, The Sea of Poppies, to, uh, to, to many others. I mean, I won't waste time on this. But also, for instance, by the, the, the Wire, the HBO series that really covered these categories that are at the core of the special issues. Consumers, traders, dealers, pro uh, um, well, producers, traders, and enforcers. Uh, and so, so I hope that you'll, you'll sort of find, find uh, the special issue and today's seminar actually a very sort of refreshing uh, sort of uh, uh, invitation to, to sort of situate drugs in the understanding of uh, contemporary you know, worlds of policy and of, of life. Uh, so the speakers, let's get to, no, housekeeping, first of all. For those who are online, you need to send your questions to the email address that you probably received when you registered, kb35 at soas.ac.uk. And turn off your mobile phones, please. And the exit is there in case of fire. Uh, <laughs> there was a bit of a citation there, but uh, for those who. Anyway, 
The, the, the first speaker, I think, is Frances Thompson, right? And uh, she'll be uh, presenting on, uh, on, the, on the Colombian case. Uh, Frances is a lecturer in peace and development studies at Bradford University and was previously a, a postdoctoral researcher or a research associate, maybe, at the Drugs and Disorder Project at SOAS. Uh, she completed her PhD uh, in 2018 on land dispossession in Colombia, am I right? Okay, that's good. Um, but she also has excessive experience of field work and actual institutional membership in Colombia, the Universidad de Caldas and Universidades Autónoma de Manizales in Colombia, as I said. Uh, then we have Neil Carrier, who is uh, an associate professor of anthropology at Bristol University. I know Neil from Oxford when, where, when he was my internal examiner for confirmation of status. Uh, uh, and we are still friends despite that, that event. Uh, <laughs> Neil is, I think, the leading expert, uh, I would say worldwide, on CAT in Africa, CAT or CAT in Africa. And uh, as of recently, he has started, uh, 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 well, he's, he's part of a UK ARI project on cannabis Africana. He, he has also a wide sort of uh, range of interests uh, connected to his anthropological approach uh, to the study of, uh, uh, well, Kenya, the Somali community, photography and transnational trade and migration. Uh, and he'll be speaking after Francis. And finally, our discussant was Neve Eastwood, uh, who is the executive director of Release, the UK Center of Expertise on Drugs and Drugs Law. Uh, she has co-authored the publication A Quiet Revolution, Drug Decriminalization Around the Globe, very timely as things are changing all around, uh, but not probably enough yet. And, and the other publication, which I think is absolutely crucial given you know, the state of the world we live in, which is the color of injustice, race, drugs, and law enforcement in England and Wales. So that's enough for me. Uh, I leave the floor to Francis. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, actually looking for a timer so I don't speak too much. Um, can you hear me okay? Good. So um, my intervention today is based on a paper I co-authored with Camilo, who's here, I can see. Um, and our paper is about everyday experiences of law enforcement, uh, specifically coca growers in Putumayo, uh, which you can see there on the map, in the south of Colombia, in the Amazon region. It's very fancy, <laughs> the change. Um, so our paper is inspired by this statement, everything peasants do is illegal. And the story behind it briefly is that uh, a, a, a female social leader, community organizer and coca farmer was explaining to us why the municipal government couldn't give uh, resources to help them build their road. They were building their own road and she said, the municipal government isn't allowed to help us because our road is illegal. And then she said, you see, everything we do is illegal. Um, so the way she put it was particularly powerful in its simplicity, but it wasn't um, an unusual theme. So it was a theme that came up a lot during our field work. Um, so, this quote here is from a coca farmer from Valle Guamés, which is one municipality over from Puerto Asís. And he says, um, this community used to produce a lot of rice, but unfortunately those legal rats from the town, that's what I call them, the police, would steal the peasants' rice because it's illegal. So on the one hand, there's no market for our goods, and on the other, if one produces for consumption, the police steals it, so we don't have a way out. The only option the state leaves us is to keep cultivating coca. So there what he's referring to is the confiscation of rice due to um, lacking appropriate sanitary, phytosanitary certificates. Um, and so to reiterate, what our paper focuses on is experiences of law enforcement, and we focus specifically on police confiscations related to phytosanitary and sanitary violations 
and counter-narcotics specifically forced eradication, aerial and manual, and we also touch on counterinsurgency. And what you learn from listening to um, peasants' accounts is that for them, the war on drugs is just one part of the wider, a wider war on the peasantry. Um, so they are criminalized for many of the things they do in their everyday lives, um, not just their activities that are linked to coca. And what this also shows us is that their experience rela um, related to law enforcement, it, it doesn't fit neatly into different policy boxes. So it's not like they think about their relationship with law enforcement only in terms of, okay, this is counter-narcotics, this is uh, phytosanitary norms, for example. So just to give a bit of context, um, as speaking to the kind of wider relevance of our paper, um, in Colombia there's this, narrative that's dominant, which is um, that the reason Putumayo and other parts of Colombia have uh, drug producing regions have problems is because there's a lack of state, because the state is absent. Um, and so there's a focus on bringing more state and more in law enforcement to these regions as kind of the solution um, to, to many different problems. Um, and this, this narrative continues to, to be um, popular despite a lot of criticisms of it. Um, and it's actually part of the sort of justification in some ways of part of the peace agreement um, interventions. So, um, and, and th there is of course an element of truth to this narrative, but like others, we, we challenge it, uh, the simple version of it. And what, we're, what we show is that actually um, law enforcement, which is, should be a public good, is actually often perceived as a public bad. Oops, whoops. Okay. Um, so the, 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 problem, the problem then is that the way law enforcement is um, carried out makes, um, interferes with livelihoods and then this generates antipathy towards the state. So these are some examples here. What can we expect from a state that poisons us with glyphosate? The government has got us all confused with its lies. And I prefer to do service for my community than to do military service and risk my life for government that doesn't care about us. Um, and so this brings me to the everyday approach, which is the focus of the panel today. Um, and I'm just gonna make three points about this. So the first point is just how an everyday approach really helps us to kind of breathe life into what is an otherwise distant reality. And I think most people would understand that fumigations, for example, or forced eradication negatively impact on peasants' livelihoods. And it, it's quite an obvious statement, but it's only when you take it to the everyday that it becomes uh, real. And the funny thing is that often in Colombia media, the, uh, the, they'll say, oh, the peasants are protesting because the FARC or the mafia are, are pressuring or forcing them to do so as if they didn't have reason enough on their own to protest. Um, so the everyday perspective really helps us kind of bring, bring breathe, like I said, breathe life into this reality. Um, and these are just a couple of, of quotes that sort of provide a hint at that reality, which we try to uh, cover more in more detail in the paper. Um, so when the cattle eat poison grass, they die. So if the plane has passed and they fumigate our grass, we had to get the cattle out right away. Um, so once you see this kind of everyday reality of forced eradication, it's quite obvious then um, why these policies, which are supposed to um, reinforce state authority, actually end up undermining it. Um, the second point about the everyday um, is uh, as I said before, um, peasants experience drug control in relation to other, for other types of law enforcement. So they don't necessarily compartmentalize their everyday experiences of law enforcement into different boxes. Um, and then the experience with one type of law enforcement colors kind of future interactions um, and all these different experiences overlap. And it's the everyday approach that allows us to see, see this. Um, so these quotes, I hope, uh, show that, that kind of overlapping of different issues in their, in their you know, everyday lives. 
Um, so she says, 20 families have dedicated themselves to raising pigs, but then they crash against the reality that they can't take those pigs to town to sell because the police take them. And it's as if you were working with coca because you have to bring them hidden. Um, and this other person says, we're looking into legalizing our fish farm, but they ask us for a lot of papers. <coughs> Though they let the oil companies do whatever they want, the police ask for a lot. It's always butts and money. Um, and my final point um, about the everyday kind of follows from the last two points. Um, and that's that one can't really probably understand state formation and state building without examining the concrete and routine interactions between individuals or small groups of people and government functionaries. Um, and that's the quote from, uh, from our paper rather than from um, one of the producers, that an everyday perspective is vital for understanding how social acceptance of a state's authority is made and unmade. So I actually surprisingly went very fast and didn't even use all my time, which is very unusual. I usually speak too much, but hopefully that means there's more time for questions and discussion. to try and keep to time as well, so tick that one. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So, so, so very nice to be, uh, to be here. Oh, I've just knocked the... Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Not an auspicious start. But very, very nice to be here at SOAS. And um, yes, it, it, it feels quite, a, quite an honour to be coming through to London these days, actually, having, uh, uh, in the post-COVID era, having not been, been for so long. Anyway, so really nice to be here. And thank you for the warm introductions, Maziar. And thanks to Jonathan as well for organising the, the seminar series. Uh, so today, um, I come without a, without a presentation, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the substance uh, CAT, uh, which I've been researching for, for quite a long time now. I, I might not even go into how long it's been. Um, but I should perhaps have brought some um, a presentation with some pictures of Cat. But I was kind of assuming that an audience at SOAS might be have at least some familiarity with the, uh, uh, with the substance in, in question. So <laughs> not casting any aspersions. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, so uh, I was asked by, by Mazia, um, I'm not sure how many years ago now, maybe three years, to, to think about kind of um, writing a paper on the, on the theme of the everyday. Uh, and it did, it did strike me, it did take me back to my, you know, thinking about my cat research and how I could pull that into, um, into a paper uh, phrased on the, uh, or based around that concept of the, uh, the everyday. So the paper I did end up writing um, really does focus on that, that kind of mundane interactions of life that people have, especially some of my trader friends. So I research CAT, um, for those of you who aren't necessarily that familiar with it, but CAT, this, um, uh, you know, more or less mild uh, stimulant that's uh, uh, cultivated a lot throughout the East African region. So a lot of cultivation in Ethiopia a lot of um, consumption as well in places like Djibouti and Somalia and Somaliland. Uh, but I was principally uh, researching it in Kenya, uh, so th where, where a lot of it is, is grown quite intensively. So I re was researching it there and looking at it in the farming regions. But I also spent quite a lot of time getting to know traders of cat. Uh, and in Kenya, uh, cat is more commonly known as mira, so I should, I should put that in. But I, I uh, got to know quite a lot of cat traders based in, in Nairobi. So and as part of my methodology, really, uh, with the, the research in Nairobi, a lot of my time was spent hanging out, you know, the deep hanging out of anthropological research, the kind of uh, quote uh, Clifford Geertz. But that, that took place in, in some of these kiosks which tend to be very, very small kind of places on the, on the roadside, generally selling a lot, of, um, a lot of household goods as well, and, you know, sweets and uh, soda, soda drinks and these kind of things as well. But a lot of my time in Nairobi was, was spent in these, uh, these kiosks, not just um, at the times when they were selling cat, but kind of all, all throughout the day. And really getting to, know, getting to know these traders who were principally Meru. Uh, so Meru were the, the people who mostly grow cat in Kenya, kind of just northeast of Mount Kenya, there's a, the, the Meru, Meru County. And within that, there's an area that really intensively um, uh, grows, uh, grows cat. 
So I got to know these, uh, these Meru traders and really spent a lot of time hanging out with them, but also following them about their daily kind of chores, you know, when they were going off to, uh, to get cat at the wholesale markets or the wholesale kind of depots and uh, getting to know them and also their lives and their connections back to Meru. Uh, you know, these were people who were being supplied by relatives and others back in um, back in the Meru district. So really did follow them as well, you know, as they travelled back to uh, to Meru uh, and looking at, uh, you know, how they got this commodity to Nairobi and then, you know, who they were selling it to and all, all these kinds of uh, these kind of things. So a lot of my and this is perhaps, you know, the nature of anthropological research is a lot of it. Of course, it's about the everyday and the mundane, you know, spending time getting to know people in, in those social settings and, um, uh, you, you know, a lot of the things you will be, will be, will be doing or uh, participating in will be quite mundane activities. So this was the case with this and, you know, seemed like a, ni a nice theme to kind of look at in terms, of the, in terms of the everyday and really allow me to focus in on, you know, some things that maybe I might in my writings on cat might not have uh, dwelled, dwelled upon quite so, uh, quite so much. I should say, uh, just a little rider, that, um, for, the, for again, those who aren't familiar, cat is actually legal in Kenya. So, um, but even though it is still treated with quite a bit of suspicion in Kenya, so it does have what some people, or kind of is, is termed like a, a quasi-legal kind of category. There's a lot of ambiguity about its status. Uh, which has changed, and uh, I, can, I can get into that a little bit later if anyone's interested. But it's still, a, a lot of people are quite suspicious of this substance, and it tends to be more sold in kind of informal, um, informal settings in, uh, in, in Kenya. So it's perhaps it does contrast quite a bit with some of the other substances um, uh, within, the, within the special issue and that uh, we'll be hearing about, hearing about today. Anyway, what, so what I did in this, in this paper... Um, is, is basically looking at three, three particular aspects of the, the everyday, everyday um, or how the everyday kind of comes in as a, um, uh, a useful category to look at in, in relation to CAT. So the first thing I look at in the paper is really looking at a lot of the, the rhythms and kind of the, the temporalities um, uh, that, that flow around, around CAT and it's uh, not just its kind of everyday life, um, but looking at like the, the rhythms of you know the cultivation of the, the very tree itself, um, and the, the kind of like the uh, with wine and things like this, like the very best quality cat is always said to come from the oldest trees. So that has its own sort of temporality. You know these trees of a hundred years, some of them a hundred years old or or more that come into it. But then also looking at those sort of everyday uh, patterns, like when the cat. And it is the stems and leaves of uh, what's grown as quite a big tr uh, tree in Kenya that, that is the, the harvested commodity. Uh, but really looking at those everyday practices, you know, when cat's ready for harvest, like all the, all, all the uh, activities that go into getting cat from um, these stems of cat from the tree, uh, uh, bundling them all up, um, uh, wrapping them up, then sending them uh, usually very, very quickly to Nairobi. So what one key thing that I've, talked about quite a bit over the years with relation to cat is how perishable it is you know this is something that people do want fresh so it's notorious in kenya you know some of you may be aware of this and and ethiopia as well like you, you know you you will often um, find yourself you know if you're driving in in kenya in this kind of area like having to get to the side of a road quite quickly as like a cat vehicle uh, speeds on by so looking a little bit at these kind of um, uh, these kind of uh, temporalities as well as well as then the temporalities that link to kind of consumption of it. So as uh, Mazia was saying about the, you know, how like dealers and consumers can kind of blur into each other as a category. One thing that I was bringing out quite a bit in, in uh, or trying to bring out in my paper is like a lot of these traders I, I did get to know, most of them when they were trading, they would be chewing cat at the, at the same time, but more or less, Kind of, you know, in a very similar way to how a lot of people might have coffee or things like this, you know, to keep them going, to keep them alert at, at work. Um, I was kind of looking at that contrast, uh, comparing that with um, what is often different patterns of consumption, like the kind of people who chew at the weekend. Uh, and a lot of Kenyans will, you know, save their chewing for the weekend. Um, and, uh, you know, when it's more perhaps of a binge kind of chewing, uh, you know, chewing all the, the Saturday night. So looking at the, those kind of different sort of rhythms of consumption as well and, you know, wh what's the social significance of those different rhythms um, uh, might come out. 
But another key aspect of the everyday that I was looking at was the kind of the everyday support that people uh, developed, you know, that these traders, not just related to um, their, their networks back to the area where the cat comes from, and not just their networks of support amongst fellow Meru uh, people trading cat in, in Nairobi, but much wider. So, you know, a lot of my traders selling cat in downtown, a lot of my people I got to know trading cat in downtown Nairobi, you know, they'd have lots of contacts from their consumer base of, you know, much wider beyond, you know, fellow uh, cat traders. And these really were very important, I think, for these kind of mutual forms of support and kind of forms of moral community that, that were established around these uh, cat kiosks in, in downtown Nairobi. And certainly, um, you know, forms of support that were very helpful to me at times in, in my research, you know, uh, all the, the networks around and very, very kind of safe uh, areas when you were in those kind of networks as well. And the third thing I was looking at was really looking at the, the kind of everyday dreams of uh, a lot of these cat traders uh, selling, um, uh, you know, how, uh, so I go into a few different aspects of this, but, but looking at, um, you know, how for a lot of them, they're, they're quite, quite proud, a lot of Meru in particular, of being cat traders. You know, there's not much uh, stigma for Meru people in, in um, selling this, uh, this substance cat. So there's nothing like that. But still a lot of them, um, you know, st still I think their dreams of the future, uh, do uh, for them, t uh, their dreams would take them away from CAT, I think a lot of them, you know, rather than being at that kind of, um, uh, the, the, those kind of everyday activities. And it is quite an arduous lifestyle being a CAT trader. You know, a lot of them do dream of those days beyond it. And also like for the future generations, so friends of mine, uh, CAT traders who had kids, um, kids growing up in Nairobi as well, you know, a lot of the, the future they were imagining for their kids really was taking those kids away from the everyday as well. You know, different dreams that they would have for where the next generation could, um, uh, could go for. So really in all this, looking at how aspects of the everyday and rhythms and temporalities and moral communities formed in the everyday really help, uh, help can help us understand, you know, more uh, better how, how the, these... Um, uh, this cat trade works in, in somewhere like, uh, like I say, principally focusing on Nairobi, but also how ordinary, you know, a lot of the activities for a substance that certainly when I came to it, you know, I did see it myself as quite an extraordinary thing, you know, because I was drawn to it. Obviously, as a researcher, your focus is on that substance, you know, my project was about that substance, but then getting to know like the very ordinary uh, lives and um, rituals and aspects around this uh, this substance, I think really, really is a very important thing to, to get to grips with, not just with cat, but with any, any drug really, to see how, um, you know, these aren't, these aren't necessarily always the, these extraordinary, as Mazia was saying, you know, exciting moments as portrayed in, the, in the, the films, but, you know, to properly understand and grasp this and to properly humanise the trade and in these kind of substances and how, how they work. I think this everyday um, prism upon the, these kind of substances is a really, a really, really valuable one. So, so I think I've finished my time and we'll, we'll end there, but look forward to some questions. So thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you so much, Mazia, for the invitation, and Jonathan and everybody for the invitation to participate in the discussion this evening. Um, I'm not an academic, so I have the pleasure of working at Release, and every day we provide services to people who use drugs, people who have been criminalised because of our drug laws, people who have been over-policed because of our drug laws, people whose family lives are disrupted because of the drug laws who have had their children taken away, who um, are drug tested at work. These are the everyday experiences that people have because of drug prohibition. And I really want you to think about the tentacles that, that it, it, it achieves in its application, how far it, in, and how deep reaching it is in terms of how it impacts people who use drugs. And, and I think this really picks up on a number of the papers, including Mazia's paper, which I would really recommend on narco-capitalism how the drug laws affect people who are part of the market, but how it also affects people outside the market and how it can be used as a form of social and racial control. And so what I want to really talk about over the next few minutes is sort of three main themes that came from um, all the papers for me were around the inequity of drug law enforcement, 
the violence of drug law enforcement and picking up on Mazia's paper that the solutions that we are advocating for in drug policy reform often have to navigate capitalism but what we're trying to do is take the energy and the harm that exists within capitalism that causes so much of the trauma that um, communities who are involved in the drug trade um, experience and I just want to quote what Mazia says in his paper drugs are not the bearer of violence predation alienation rather these are part and parcel of capitalist forms of life and so therefore the drugs market operates within the principles of capitalism and it's actually a lot of the harms of the economy that creates the harms that communities um, experience. So when we hear politicians talk about drugs destroying lives and communities, I think we really have to question whether it's their policies and their lack of investment in communities that are causing the harms that are experienced. And in fact, only yesterday, Dame Carol Black, who was um, appointed by the Home Office to look at the drugs problem in the UK, tweeted um, that drugs destroy lives, ruin families and tear communities apart. Whereas, in fact, if we look at you know, the, the example that Frances puts in her paper around the lack of trust that people who are affected by drug prohibition and drug law enforcement experience in relation to their relationship with the state, I think these are the things that we must explore. These are the things that cause the harms to community, that leave people behind. Um, and we know, coming back to inequity, first of all, that drug law enforcement is not applied in an equitable way. We see that every day, and whether it be the, the cocoa farmers in um, Colombia, whether it be the, the opium farmers in um, Afghanistan, in Myanmar. Um, in the UK, we see that it is communities living in poverty, it is communities of colour who are subject to the worst aspects of drug law enforcement. Um, and so there is much shared between the campesinos um, in Colombia and the, the people who supply cannabis or who are over policed by the cannabis laws in communities across the UK. Uh, research, and, and Mazia kindly mentioned the, the, the report that we did, The Colour of Injustice, showed that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs in England and Wales, despite using drugs at a lower rate compared to the white population. We know from our research that when we look at the um, use of policing of drugs, that it is communities living in poverty that experience the much more intense experience of stop and search. And that everyday experience of stop and search, again, I'd ask you to think about it. Imagine being a young black kid walking out of your home, not knowing if you're going to get to school, you know, not knowing if you're going to be stopped and searched for the fourth time this week, fourth time in the day, what that experience is like. And we're actually working with a group of um, young people uh, from North London, um, young black men who are brilliant, on a racial justice fellowship program to try and build awareness of, of um, the problems of drug law enforcement and the opportunities in reform when we look at the solutions. Um, one of those young men said to me, he's over at Birkbeck tonight, they've got the course on a Thursday night in Birkbeck, it's very cool. Um, and he said to me, um, you know, those middle class people up in, in Middle England, they think the weed's the problem. I mean, they think that that's why our communities are suffering. He said, you imagine what it's like. I walk out my door, I don't know if I'm going to get down the street or if I'm going to be arrested, stopped and searched, possibly taken to the police station. The violence in my community, um, the lack of opportunity, the trauma I experience, all of these things are... Uh, one of the reasons that I smoke cannabis to make my life just a bit more manageable, a really rational response. Um, and beyond the, the experience of policing on the ground, we see that when uh, black people are caught in possession of drugs, they are treated much more harshly. So they are much more likely to receive um, a, uh, they're much more likely to be prosecuted rather than receiving an out of court disposal, which doesn't result in the criminal record. Those are reserved for white people. So we see the inequity in the application of the laws. And these laws are not being applied equally. We see politicians constantly admitting to their drug use. Most of the, the not the last Tory leadership campaign, or the one before, or the, a few before, we saw several of them admit to their cannabis use. And they were not subject to stop and search, and they were not criminalised, and yet um, these young people are. And again, that idea of deprivation feeding in and inequity feeding into the experience, the worst harms of our drugs policies, which is overdose deaths. 
And in the US, and um, in the US alone since 1999, they've had over a million deaths. Um, and in the UK, we have, for the 10th year in the row, the highest rate of drug-related deaths on record, with 17 people dying in the country every single day. And those deaths, again, are concentrated in areas of deprivation. And this goes back to Maziot's point, the trauma of capitalism, the trauma of um, economic policies, policies that serve the few rather than the many. Um, and again, reflecting on Francis's point about the legitimacy of state, why would you engage with a state that isn't there for you, that doesn't respect you, that doesn't support you or your families? And drug law enforcement is a tool of how that oppression works. And then the violence of drug law enforcement. And again, I think this is a shared experience across the world and an everyday experience. Um, and bringing that back to the, the, the sort of global north context, um, we look at the, the murder of George Floyd. We look at the, the death of Rashan Charles here in London at the hands of police, where both were demonized as drug users and drug suppliers as a way of legitima legitimating, legitimizing state violence against them. And we see that vilification all the time. Again, the kind of idea of violence in the acts of the state through the prism of drug law enforcement. I think we see when we look at things like COVID, during COVID, I expected in March 2020 for the first time for stop search figures to drop. I was quite looking forward to that. I was quite shocked to see by May that they had increased from 26,000 in March to 46,000 stop and searches in May. And these were not for COVID related issues. They were largely for drugs. 70% of all searches in London were for drugs during that period. And that was disproportionately impacting on black people and disproportionately impacting on uh, communities that were suffering the worst aspects of COVID. Um, so again, that final action, and, and uh, you know, I spoke to a Met Police officer afterwards and, and asked them why, and they were like, we were told to practice, we were told to get out and you know, use this time to improve our skills. People got angry with us, so we started to use handcuffs. Well, of course people were getting angry at you. We were getting angry with each other in parks whenever people got too close. Imagine what it was like to be a young person walking down the streets of Brixton and the next thing, a group of police officers hold you when you're told that that is the opposite of what should be done in the middle of a pandemic. So yes, the everyday experience is an experience of anger at the state, at the violence that is perpetrated against communities where drug law enforcement is that tool of control. And um, you know, one example I've got from our helpline during that period is a woman rang me who had been out in the park she got up, she tucked a black woman in her 30s, got up, tucked her uh, shirt in, and police came over and said, you're trying to conceal drugs. And she said, I'm not, I'm out for my hour. That's, you know, I'm tucking the shirt in. Carried out a stop search, nothing found. They decided to detain her, take her to the police station where they strip searched her. Um, this is the violence. She had gone through sexual violence herself. It caused a huge um, relapse of the trauma that she had been dealing with. And so that lack of trust, that lack of legitimacy that Frances so eloquently explains, uh, expresses in her paper is an experience that's shared every day across the world in communities where drug law enforcement is the primary tool that is used to oppress those communities. And thinking about solutions, and I am really struck with what Mazia says around um, capitalism and the harms of it and what Neil describes of a market that isn't subject to the levels of law enforcement that we see in those countries that are described in the other papers and thinking about the solutions and I think the drug policy reform movement has worked really hard in recent years to think about solutions that really relieve the harms that have been done to communities that have been over policed and over incarcerated in recognition that not all of those groups will be drug users or drug suppliers or drug producers, that many will be people who are targeted by these laws. And so looking at that, we must look at solutions that relieve those harms for all of those communities. And so decriminalization, Mazi has um, uh, mentioned that we've written a report on that and over 40 countries in the world now have adopted um, some form of decriminalization for drug possession. So that's ending criminal sanctions. But st some are still predicated, of those examples, are still predicated on using law enforcement to determine if someone deserves a civil fine, for example. And if we want to relieve that harm that is experienced by com communities who are over police, then what we need to do is we need to be talking about no punishment models. We need to take drugs out of the hands of police. 
um, at least with regards to possession, as the first step in reform. And what that looks like is what we have in the UK already with the Psychoactive Substances Act, where possession of substances that are controlled under that act aren't a criminal offence. So the police can't stop you for possession of a so-called legal high. So we do this already. There is no reason we can't expand that to the other drugs. And then we move on to reform of the markets. And I think there are really interesting examples coming out of the US. I don't think any of us expected it at all. I think we expected the US to be ground zero for a very hyper uh, corporate commercial market. It's not. There are some states that are attempting to bring in social equity models that seek to repair the damage that have been done to communities that are over-policed. And whilst that is not a dismantling of capitalism, I feel that it is an opportunity to use drug law reform to look at economic models that are fairer and serve people more effectively. And um, we can talk about those models in the, the questions. Um, I think if we look at the, 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 the racial justice uprising of 2020 and what was called for defunding the police became what was a controversial slogan that is simply moving money out of law enforcement into solutions that prevent crime from happening. Remember that every time we fund the police or prisons, we're accepting that crime will happen. There are better solutions. We should all work towards that. Um, so... What I think we have to do in terms of reform and changing policy is identify the tentacles of prohibition and work out how we can remove those tentacles from each and every part of our lives. Thank you. That's the, yeah. Okay. It works even too much, maybe. Um, but. Thank you very much, everyone, for, I think, uh, uh, very timely and on-time presentations. And I think we covered uh, lots of interesting aspects and uh, sort of challenging aspects of uh, how we can use the everyday as a frame to understand uh, the challenges uh, of drug policy, drug politics, and the word that we didn't really use. Uh, which is the war on drugs, mm -hmm. which is a terrible world. Uh, world. And I think, uh, although I'm the chair, I think I'm also part of the special issue as a contributor, so I'd be happy to sort of, sort of jump in with some comments and things that perhaps I couldn't say uh, when I introduced you. So uh, before taking questions, I'll just say a couple of words about uh, your, your comments about the papers. Uh, uh, the project overall and the special issue faced enormous challenges. Just if you think COVID was the m m sort of the minor challenge we had. Uh, we covered countries in Myanmar, Afghanistan, and Colombia. Over the past three years, if you read the news, you know things have happened in these countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Afghanistan is the most, I think, dramatic and tragic uh, sort of uh, shift of events that... Uh, we, I couldn't foresee in this in this sort of time time frame, and of course that ha affected our research quite quite dramatically. Nonetheless, we managed to to of course gather data prior, of course, to the uh, Taliban uh, takeover. But of course, it was uh, I think emotionally for the entire team, especially those working in Afghanistan, very difficult. Um, Colombia. Uh, in continuity with its past, and of course you know better than, than myself, uh, increased violence in part at the same time of COVID, like taking advantage of COVID to uh, suppress and attack social activists and people who have been very much at the forefront of building a different world, including a different world and place for drugs in Colombia. And, and finally, Myanmar, uh, with the military coup d'etat that, uh, or at least takeover that happened there and which of course escalated things, uh, including for our research team. Uh, the second point I wanted to mention on what you said, uh, as you made reference uh, to narco-capitalism, which is the subject of my own paper, uh, its definition is, uh, it was my sort of odd way to just say that drugs are just part of a system we live in, which is capitalism. And narco-capitalism is not distinct or different or just an oddity within capitalism. It is the capitalism that works when we look at this commodity which has been made illegal. By being made illegal, 
it hasn't been sort of erased from the world. It's actually part of a market that works very much as a free market because it's completely unregulated and everything goes. Uh, and, it, it, and the everyday helps us to do uh, uh, something which is quite essential, I think, which is demystifying this idea of the war on drugs, which is actually a war on people. It's like it's not a war on a substance. Uh, and the war on the people, uh, in my paper, I suggest it, there are two demystifications that we need, three actually, but I'll speak about two. One is the war peace demystification. We think that when drugs are not there, there is peace. And when drugs are there, there is war. Often, when we look at the everyday, the contrary applies. There are areas in which you know, there is a massive trading of illicit drugs, but there is relative peace. And there are places where drugs have been eradicated and conflict has erupted even more violently. And the other is chaos government. That means that places where there is strong government uh, there is actual sort of rule of law and the places where there are like sort of insurgencies and sort of chaotic government or no government at all, uh, they are completely abandoned and chaotic, which again, from Colombia to elsewhere, we see it doesn't really apply always. And that's connected to the sort of place that drugs have also in implementing what can be just defined as public authority as opposed to formal informal government. And uh, in, in your uh, it's amazing, I think, sort of overview of the special issue and a sort of uh, reading of it, I think what uh, we can take as contributors is this strong connection that we see between our cases that are from the global south and the experiences of global north countries from North America to Europe to the UK, uh, in which we see that, of course, the, perhaps the scale of the problem and the scale of the violence perpetrated upon people may be different, but perhaps the roots of a mindset that applies to drugs is, 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 is fairly similar, and that can be traced back to a historical process that took shape in the 20th century. So uh, with this, I hope I didn't take too much time, but I think Frances was short in her presentation, so she gave me her five minutes. Uh, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand, and those who are asking questions online, uh, we'll deal with them through... Uh, Fantastic. Questions? Yeah. Um, so we have an on we have an online question from um, Jayanthi Lingham, um, who says, "I would like to ask a question to all the speakers about the use of the everyday as an analytical framework. I think one of its strengths is to draw attention to the significance of the social reproductive sphere." For example, Nancy Fraser said that we can only understand the hidden abodes of capitalist production when we also explore their background conditions of possibility, that is, the labours and dynamics of social reproduction. Neve's comments pointed to some ways in which social reproduction shifts in the everyday lives of drugs. I wondered whether social reproduction had been explored as part of the project analysis in conjunction with production of consumption enforcement and dealing, or whether there are plans to do so going forward. Thank you very much. I think it's a very strong question. So whoever is the person, thank you. Uh, who would like to start? Should we start from the end of the table? Yeah. I th that sound okay? Um, yeah, thank you. That was a really, really great uh, question and brings to mind in, in, in my own paper, actually, thinking about those sort of generational uh, links that, that I was kind of bringing out a little bit and obviously talk a bit more about in the in the paper but those kind of re yeah relations of uh, you, you know where the, where these kind of trader friends of mine where they were seeing their children you know generations to come and that kind of um, relationship to to cat and the everyday and the everyday world which are, you know obviously a key focus of their everyday lives so uh, you know, these traders, like a, a key part of their everyday lives, the ones with um, with kids in Nairobi, you know, did revolve around the around the uh, taking the kids to school, all these kind of uh, these kind of activities. So I think that that dimension does speak quite well to um, uh, you know aspects of social reproduction and where where they do you know those everyday dreams as well for the for future generations um, would would come into it. So, and also I think what one thing that that comes out there is how. 
because uh, I think for quite quite a lot of the the Meru people who who I met, when they would talk about cat being quite a positive thing for their community, often the thing they would use to justify to justify cat as being a positive uh, was the fact that uh, you know it paid for school fees. They would they would uh, quite often uh, use this phrase. And I know in, in my uh, current project, looking at, um, at cannabis as well, this often does come up. You know, people, uh, you know, like people shouldn't necessarily feel that they have to justify this, but uh, people often do. I think when they are commodities that are seen, you know, by some people with with suspicion or as illegal, people do feel they have to justify. So it's quite interesting that education is often something that people bring in. I think when they talk about, you know, look, this. This stuff, you know, it can't be, it can't be bad, and in fact, can be can be good because it is paying for the next generation's um, education. So, so I think that that might be a link to social reproduction as well. So, but thank you for the question, Francis. Just to follow up quickly on on what Neil said, because there's a lot of similarities actually with producers in Colombia using the you know. Um, using their coca incomes to pay for schooling as well. And so there's a really similar discourse about, well, you know, this is what allows us to send our children to school and even to university. Um, so that's a, a commonality. And then I would just add, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but um, in terms of social reproduction and how that supports coca production specifically, um, Colleagues within the project did work on, um, for example, women's role in coca production. And so um, women would often, for example, do the cooking, um, not always, but often do the cooking for the farm laborers, um, for example. Um, and that's a key, <laughs> a key part of coca production because as we learned, some of the biggest arguments uh, between the owners of the coca crops and the produce and the pickers was about food. That's the one thing that people would get really upset about if if they were stingy with the meals, um, or if the food wasn't very good. Then the pickers would say, "We're not going to pick there again." You know, they would have an argument about that. So, um, I'm not sure if I was I'm going the right way with the question, but that that I would say is um, like a, a really important sort of invisible role of. Um, or often invisibilized role of women in, in the in the production process. Neil, would you have some comment on this? I mean, as the non-academic who's having a hard time understanding the social reproduction, I'll have a go. <laughs> um, so I, I suppose just from the, the, the sort of the UK context and working in this field around, you know, the idea of the binary here with. Um, people who use drugs and, and people who supply drugs and even within supply the idea that that's a homogenous group so I think often when we talk about people who supply drugs the, the image that you get is someone who is using violence someone who is um, exploitative someone who's hanging around school corner you know schools to, to supply drugs which is obviously all a nonsense um, but I think there is certainly in communities that we work in the the, the trade allows for some level of social cohesion, not least because of the economic means that it provides where there would have been an absence of those means. And that's why I think those conversations that we are starting, that we are having, not starting to have, but in the drug policy reform movement, around how do we make sure that what we advocate for is just in terms of providing transitional routes for people out of the illegal market into the illicit market and not expecting them to participate in the illicit market but making sure that those opportunities are there by providing levers. So I think in that sense there is some level of social cohesion that can be contributed to the drugs trade as it operates. It will also cause a dismantling of reproduction. You know, I think, I think the idea of social reproduction as I understand it and the idea of communities helping each other and supporting each other. I think to some degree, certainly amongst the using community, we've seen a dismantling of that around kind of heroin use and crack cocaine use and the more dependent drugs. Whereas years before you would have had a group of older drug users who would have supported people on that journey. That's, we see much more isolation in that now. And that's, that's concerning to me because I think that causes greater harms and, and increase of overdose deaths and all of those things. Thank you. Um, 
I, I won't comment too much, but I would say uh, something perhaps for all, well, the other contributors were not here. Uh, some of the papers uh, dealt with uh, the questions of emotion, of affection, uh, in, in the world of dealing, in the world of trafficking, which again is something where, you know, that is the stuff of the everyday life. And, you know, where people are uh, sort of influenced by their emotional state, by the bonds with others, and these are shaped by everyday experiences. Uh, no paper dealt with the question of social reproduction as such, and we have no claim of having covered everything in the everyday in the special issue. Uh, and so in a way, by the end of uh, the project, we also, I think at least myself, uh, come to realize that uh, this has been a very useful exercise to actually take even more seriously the frame of the everyday. Mm -hmm. uh, and so questions such as the one asked, I think actually help to sort of give new directions in, in the future applications of this. Uh, so yeah, and, uh, no more comment from me on that. Any other question? Yes, please, gentlemen on the left. And if people can introduce themselves, that's also a very useful offer. Can, can you hear me? Should I use? OK, OK. Um, in, uh, uh, yeah, uh, sure, OK. Um, OK, my question is for Anil and Francis. Um, I, I've always had this, um, like, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm Diego Andres Lugo, I'm professor uh, from Colombia, I, I live in Colombia, um, but I also happen to be, uh, I have s a very small experience in Myanmar, and uh, I've, I've, I've always, I don't know, uh, I've said since, um, I don't know, for a couple of years ago, that uh, there is no country that, res that, in my opinion, resembles more Colombia than Myanmar, e even Peru. Uh, for the uh, striking uh, similarities between two countries, uh, both of them have had a long standing la uh, armed conflict for six, seven decades. Both of them have actually gone for very uh, particular peace processes. But after, especially in the, in the last 20 years, both of them have uh, experienced also very important uh, ceasefires, uh, processes that come with um, uh, probably one paradoxical uh, situation right now. Uh, Colombia, after two peace processes negotiated in 2005 and 2016, and Myanmar in the 90s. But if you compare the, 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 the figures of coca in Colombia and opium in Myanmar, the situation not, not only hasn't changed, it has increased in terms of, of, of the area and production of cocaine and opium. In, uh, in, in a parallel situation uh, in both countries, the way uh, uh, the conflict has, has, uh, has been intervened it's with, with a lot of corporate issues, corporate uh, greening, corporate uh, solutions, corporate uh, 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 agendas. Uh, in, in the case of Myanmar, with massive land concessions. In the case of, uh, especially in the uh, Canon and, 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 and the Shannon and, and Kachin states, a lot of land concessions for private companies, uh, trans-Asian uh, companies. And in the case of Colombia, also with massive land acquisitions in areas of armed conflict, particularly in, in, in the south in Caquetá, but particularly in the eastern plains. So we have those uh, similarities between these two countries. My, my key question, my, I know it's going to be probably hard to answer, but uh, if we still have this pressure and this massive pressure on farmers uh, in both countries, what is, in your opinion, the key aspect? the key aspect that one peace negotiation or one transition towards a, 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 a life, I don't know which kind of life, what is the key aspect that policymakers and negotiators should include in, 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 in those negotiations to avoid that these problems happen uh, again? We see that corporate agendas are stronger in both, in both countries. We see that coca and opium are higher in this country right now, that means something. And I, I just want to know, what is the key aspect for you that should be covered in any negotiation? I know it's, it's, it's land, 
it's gender violence, it's corporate capitalism, it's a lot of things. But I just want to I just want to know one key aspect that you can that you can um, extract from from this uh, current situation. That is quite a tough question. <laughs> um, I mean, I suppose the question would be the key aspect to achieve what is, is the goal to reduce coca cultivation. I don't think it should be. I don't think that should be the goal. So um, that kind of changes it and turns it around. Um, but one thing that um, I found very interesting with colleagues when we were doing field work was in the early kind of phases of the implementation of the National um, Illicit Crop Substitution Program, which was part of the peace deal. Um, there, part of the part of the agreement was participation, and one thing that was really interesting was to go to. Um, like these spaces, these meetings where representatives of cocoa growers could attend and express their ideas and their wishes. And I like in the beginning, these were very well attended and people had a lot to say. Um, the cocoa growers had a lot to say. And so I think, you know, in terms of, I think the goal should be more like reducing violence, improving relations between peasants and the state, um, and you know, improving livelihoods. Um, but I think I think even even in the space of, of participation, which were really really positive and interesting to see, a lot of times there's frustration in terms of like um, it not feeding back upwards, or the functionaries that were there um, not having the power to kind of um, do things with what they were hearing. But I guess I would say that for, for me, um, yeah, I think that was probably the most positive thing. And so I would say widen this participation, but also ensure that it's not just uh, people speaking into an echo chamber so that um, government functionaries are actually listening and actually trying to do something with the information that the, you know, that the peasants are giving them. So I, yeah, I, that's where I would put the emphasis on on participation, on listening, and it not just being an exercise like in so many countries with um, free, prior, and informed consent for indigenous peoples, where it's like a tick, tick, you know, ticking boxes, and they're they're not actually listening, and they're not actually changing anything. I think it has to be genuine kind of um, participation. So yeah. I think the question was for you only, right? Yeah. Uh, any other question? Yes, please, in the middle. Uh, just in front of you, I think. Yeah, two. Yeah. That's it. Hi, uh, Kevin O'Neill. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, while SCA is legal in Kenya, because it's illegal in other countries, I was curious whether there is any intergovernmental pressure to kind of limit the production and exports so it doesn't end up in foreign markets. And I suppose as a broader point to the panel, whether intergovernmental pressure is a factor in the kind of why we are where we are, where perhaps smaller countries feel that they can't change tack or um, the current um, international drug treaties mean that their hands are bound and whilst they might like to um, do things that they're unable to. Oh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, yeah, it's re really, really interesting, actually. I think in, in relation to, to Kenya and... Um, what was very interesting and I think relevant to, to the question at hand was because uh, CAT was banned in the UK in 2014. Um, and I kind of expected that that would lead to more pressure upon Kenya, that they should uh, restrict it as well. But in fact, it's gone kind of the opposite way. So uh, since CAT was banned in the UK, the uh, government has... Partly because um, the uh, the area where cat produced is quite a strong kind of political um, uh, constituency for the, for the country, so partly they're quite quite a powerful voting block in some ways. But actually, after after the ban in the UK, the Kenyan government actually made more of a play of supporting cat. Uh, so having been in this kind of limbo, you know, not really encouraged, not really discouraged kind of phase. 
because there was so much international suspicion around cat, you know, cat, it was never declared an official cash crop and this sort of thing, you know, for decades and decades since, um, you know, since uh, Kenyan independence. So for decades it was like that. But then the, the ban in the UK, which, like I say, I thought might make give more pressure to the Kenyan government to perhaps go in that direction. But the Kenyan government actually um, pushed back, you know, and actually has now declared the cat as an official cash crop and uh, these kind of things. So... So it doesn't seem to be, I, I mean, I think it is low down the policy agenda, you know, in the uh, globally. I think perhaps more in the UK, actually, there was <coughs> intergovernmental pressure within the UK. Um, <coughs> part of the reason that led to the to the ban in the UK, you know, I think a bit of pressure coming from the US and Scandinavia, because the UK had been a, a kind of transit hub for, uh, for CAT to those uh, places where CAT was already illegal. But Kenya, I think, yeah, there's not particularly much governmental pressure. And probably the most interesting dynamic is the relationship between Kenya and Somalia, because Kenya exports a lot of uh, cat to Somalia. So there's quite a lot of tensions and diplomacy that goes around with those uh, negotiations with Somalia. But tends to be, you know, Somalia giving access to uh, for Kenyan cat producers to the Somali market, but in return for other things. So it's around around negotiation rather than maybe Somalia pushing back on. Uh, Kenya so yeah but I think I think partly it is low down the international priority stage so not that much uh, that much pressure but but thank you thanks Neil yeah there's another question just there thank you hi my name's Clemmy um, I work in drug policy reform I wondered um, if um, maybe this is a question to all of you um, um, but I wonder if we can explore more the sort of or broaden out the faces or types of the everyday I feel like we have gone for three groups that are I, I think okay let me go back I think the success of pro of of prohibition has been to stigmatize drug use I suspect most people in this room use some form of stimulant drugs whether they're pharmaceutical alcohol tobacco or illegal um, but we are still in spaces like this where we're talking about other groups. And I just wonder whether it would be useful to, for a storytelling perspective um, to broaden out some of those stereotypes, particularly in narco-capitalism, looking at, like, um, obviously we know it's not just vests, men in string vests coming out of cars in Mexico. Like, this goes up to the very top. It's, it, it's people sitting in some of our key institutions. And... Um, whether they are traders or consumers. And I wonder how much of that sort of um, has mattered to you guys in terms of the, I'm sure it has, but I mean, like, um, if you want to talk about it, um, the, yeah, broadening, broadening it out in terms of the, the storytelling of this every day, because I feel we get trapped. And I know, Neve, you know, there's been a lot of work looking at who the dealer is, like, what's the face of the dealer? I could be a dealer, but you probably wouldn't have thought of me as one. So um, I just, yeah, I'd love to know a little bit more about how mu how powerful stigmatization has been to mean that when we talk about drugs, we still talk about certain communities and we're not talking about all of society. Thank you very much. I think it's a great question. Perhaps I just spend a couple of words on on my own uh, research, which uh, didn't really fit specifically uh, in terms of fieldwork in the special issue, but in the introduction, I actually referred to something quite uh, uh, sort of close to what you're asking. So I w I, I've been working on, on the case of Iran for many years, not only on drugs, on other things as well, but uh, um, so I, in, in terms of storytelling, in the introduction to the special issue, I refer to uh, you know, one day I was in a very far away mountainous valley. Uh, the closest paved road was about 45, 50 kilometers. And um, with one of my sort of interlocutors, you know, we went out in the morning because there was a truck, a little truck really, a van, of, you know, passing by. And then people were buying stuff. And then, uh, you know, and tomato paste, you know, sort of dried bread, things that don't perish and just sort of immediately. And he went there, and I wasn't following him, and, you know, he came back with a little black box. So I said, you know, 
he, this, this bag comes only every two weeks, or every week, you know, so why didn't you buy more? And he didn't man, have money. And I said, no, I just bought something for my knee. I have knee pain. And I sympathize because I also have knee pain. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't use the same remedy at the time. Uh, and, and he showed me, and it basically was a, a box, you know, sort of a tomato box, but empty with opium. And, and for him, that was medicine because there's no pharmacy in any place nearby. And he didn't have the time or the will or even probably wasn't convinced that pharmaceutical products would do the job. And so he used the opium sold by this, you know, sort of very, very, very low, low profile uh, uh, peasant trader because the trader himself was a peasant. He would sell commodities of everyday life well, of course, including opium. <laughs> and and, and the sort of the distinction between legal and legal didn't occur to anyone there, to the trader who was selling and to the consumer who might have even sold it to someone else or just give it as a gift or whatever. And, uh, and of course, that's at the very sort of, you know, the everyday has different meanings and it's a perspective as well. Uh, often it's connected in the way at least we've kind of dealt with it mostly with uh, popular classes, working classes, peasants, people who actually do things every day, they work, <laughs> you know. And, uh, whereas, you know, when you go in the upper elite, of course they also live in the everyday, but they, their everyday is not an everyday, it's exceptional. <laughs> it's, it's quite exceptional, even in the ordinary sort of flow of time. And, and to, to study that is equally important, it's perhaps important for investigative journalists, I would say, to find out. Uh, the mostly, I would say, inconsistencies and hypocrisies and injustice, uh, like, you know, that in which drug policy, and you mentioned some of that. Uh, and it, 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 I, I, I think for academia, it might be very more, uh, much more difficult. Uh, in terms of methods, for instance, it's much easier to study working class and peasant communities because they give you access often. You know, with all due respect and, you know, sort of considerations. But, you know, so people like to share the stories probably in the hope, quite vain, unfortunately, to change things. You would find it very difficult to go and observe the everyday life of, you know, elite politics. So that's my comment on, 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 on your question. So, sorry, a a anyone else? Sorry. Well, of course, everyone else. <laughs> Before I go to that question, which is um, important and difficult, and I don't think I have a satisfa satisfactory answer, but someone else asked about um, like the role of pressures from other governments. Um, and I would say, yes, absolutely, um, in the case of Colombia, especially the United States, um, and the role of the United States putting pressure on, on, you know, on the Colombian government in terms of prohibition is huge. I wouldn't, um, that doesn't mean domestic forces don't play a role, so domestic politics is also really important. I think it's going to be um, interesting to see if, what, if anything, changes with the new president in Colombia. Um, at the moment, you know, he's, there's a lot of rhetoric against the war on drugs, critiquing the war on drugs, but the last I've heard about a month ago, eradication was still taking place. And the campaign had promised to stop forced eradication and in Putumayo a month ago it was still going on. So I mean some things happening then behind the scenes presumably like you know why couldn't the new president keep his promise to end forced eradication and one can only assume that there's certain amount of pressure going on behind the scenes. Um, but yes yeah, so I would say that uh, intergovernment pressure is really really important and um, a key factor behind why drugs policy isn't changing in the case of Colombia or hasn't changed. And then to um, Clemmy's question about the everyday, the types of the everyday. So um, just in terms of stigmatization, like so our paper was mostly focused on farmers and definitely um, I got asked a lot like, oh, but isn't that dangerous, you know, these 
criminals growing coca, you know, people just assumed that they would be dangerous people. And they're like, not at all. They're farmers. They're not, you know, they're not dangerous people. So, yeah, definitely I've noticed there's stigmatization, in, even in terms of the questions people ask. And then in terms of the kind of putting the we back in, um, you know, I... I, I don't know that this is, you know, anything kind of serious to say, but I do think it, there's some kind of strange disconnect in a way between that wor world um, and then kind of L London. I'm sure that we could go down the road to any pub and find coke, and it's completely, cocaine use is completely normalised in this country. Um, and, I mean, it's pretty much everywhere all over London, and especially in middle-class, um, you know, communities. Um, and I, I actually was thinking about that in terms of the contrast to what Neve said about, um, like, certain communities being discriminated against. But, yeah, I, I mean, it is. I think it is worth talking about we, because even though it seems far away, you know, this is our society linking then with the farmers in Colombia. Yeah, I mean, I obviously totally agree with you, Fanny, that we need to destigmatize drug use and drug supply. Um, and you know, I think, again, you picked this up in the paper, Matthew, this is a, a very recent policy. I mean, it's only 100 years old beforehand. People used drugs and supplied drugs. You could get it from a chemist. Victorian women had opium tea parties um, and syringes to inject it if they didn't want to drink it. So, you mean, this is a new policy. I, and I think, you know, often we do because it's just our job, the everyday often is that you see the worst aspects of drug law enforcement, so that's what you tend to reflect back. You know, so if you've got young people ringing your helpline saying, I've been arrested for the fourth time for possession of cannabis and I won't be able to go to university now, or you know, I, I, I won't be able to get a job, you tend to reflect that back in your conversations. Um, and we always you know, try to, as much as we can, remind um, people and politicians and policymakers that drug use is ubiquitous um, and largely it is a pleasurable, fun experience that people engage in with it because they have wonderful times socially in, in their relationships um, and that it's largely a positive experience and that the dangers exist for the 90% who have no issues with dependency is around um, unpure drugs in the market it's around risk of criminalization. Um, and I think, you mean, I totally agree around the disconnect with kind of middle-class drug users, but I also think we also have to be incredibly careful when we call out behaviors that are unacceptable because what we end up when we deal with prohibition is a ramping up of the response, so drug policy ratcheting. So we see that in the UK at the minute with the proposals from the ministry or from the Home Office to target middle-class drug users, which inevitably will lead to the targeting of people who have been historically targeted. But you know, those are the things that I think are challenging for us around saying that drug use is ubiquitous, it's fun, it's pleasurable, um, and then what the policy response for that is so that we need to negotiate it in a way that really sort of challenges the status quo and looks for policies that will really sort of relieve those harms that I talked about. Yeah, but it is a challenge. We also run a campaign called Nice People Take Drugs, because that's true. And before passing it to me, I'll just comment on that. I often listen to the radio and, you know, and, uh, you know, they interview pub managers. And, of course, they're complaining about, you know, people having less money and drinking less and the World Cup being close to Christmas and Christmas, you know, this time is tighter, energy bills and stuff. And sort of everyone is a bit sad that people are drinking less. <laughs> Uh, which, uh, which, of course, of course, you know, yes, but also <laughs> alcohol. It's not really, you know, the sort of harmless substance that you know people think of. And you know, I, I'm not going to cite David Nutt, who did this, you know, chart in which it shows what's the harm of different substances, legal and illegal. And alcohol is pretty high up. Uh, you can just, you know, look it online. But it's just to show that. Uh, you know, we, the problem really is not with this, with, with, it seems in the end with substances themselves, but is the way we kind of target them. And a lot of the harm, a lot of the sort of uh, things for which we worry, even in our daily life, 
and which, is, which are clothed in the sort of biochemical nature of these substances tend to be of a political nature. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of more or less what we told, which doesn't mean, you know, it's an invitation to use drugs or so. This is another discussion and people can individually discuss this, but on the analysis of drug policy, it's, it's, it's absolutely important to take this sort of everyday dimension seriously. That's Oh, thank you very much, Clemmy. And uh, yeah, great, great, great question and really, really important one. Um, <clears throat> I think just uh, trying to think in terms of the, the cat example, how that might come in. I think cat is quite interesting in that um, it does cut across a lot of uh, social kind of axes, social categorizations. So, for example, in Kenya, you know, you can buy cat that's super, super expensive, you know, the kind of elite level stuff, or you can buy you know, kind of the equivalent of the tea leaf sweeping sort of a sort of cat. So it is something that does straddle it. It's often more associated as a kind of lower class um, activity, but that's not actually true. You know, there's a lot of quite wealthy people who do um, who do consume it. So a lot of my friend, my trader friends in Nairobi, you know, a lot of their clientele were often quite a. Uh, uh, you know, quite wealthy people who would, um, you know, hire a taxi guy to come and pick up their um, bundle of cat and take it back, you know, to those posh, posher parts of Nairobi or what have you. So I think cat and class, it, it does kind of, um, kind of fit quite, um, quite well with that. One point, I'm not quite sure how exactly how relevant, but it did strike me in the way people talk about cat as well. So possibly linking to the the kind of the storytelling thing, but I always did have the sense that quite a lot of people. So there's a lot of debate. I, I often did get asked the question, you know, uh, when I was doing my research in Kenya, people would ask me, like, uh, you know, so Kat, you're researching it. Uh, is it a drug? You know, they would ask in that, in that way, and um, I, which I thought was a really interesting way of putting it and, and showed, like, the power of all the discourse around, you know, if you define this as a drug, then it becomes something else. And it was quite interesting, you, you know, like a lot of Meru um, people, especially people who were sort of lobbying for it on the international stage, they really would push back against the word drug, you know, uh, like, you know, call it a stimulant or these kind of things, but don't call it a, a drug kind of, uh, kind of, um, kind of thing. Which does, does, does link, I think, uh, you, you know, to those, those kind of debates. But the flip side of that was that I did, it did meet quite a few people who did quite relish, you know, they were consumers and they did quite like it, uh, the thought of it as being, being a drug, you know, quite, um, Especially y younger younger people who did you know it was a bit edgy if it was a, if they could class it as a as drug so so kind of you know some who would almost embrace the stereotype you know if cat got conflated with uh, this world of drugs some would almost quite, kind of quite embrace that whereas a lot of people would um, you know would push it aside and in in the current research like looking at cannabis and um, you know some uh, initial field work I've done on, on that project as well yeah it's interesting uh, like a lot of people do push back against that that word of cannabis uh, cannabis being a drug as well and uh, you know emphasizing that cannabis is a you know this is a medicine so you know in western Kenya like a lot of people calling it um, for the luo in western Kenya like this word yath which means that it does mean medicine so you know that's a term used to re refer to it so so I yeah I, th I think that that pushback or or in some cases embracing kind of that category of drugs quite interesting I think but um, but yeah really really important question so thank you thanks Neil uh, really interesting and we need to carry on on the discussion on uh, medicine and drug which is a big big discussion in in drug studies anyway nowadays uh, any other question Online questions? No. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. For Neve. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just, I was, I was thinking about the the sort of similarities that you noted between the way um, sort of marginalised communities in in the UK are treated by law enforcement, how they perceive law enforcement, and then kind of uh, how the farmers perceive law enforcement in Colombia. And the, I suppose the question is, I, I wondered if, I wondered if there's also this perception that it's not just about drugs, that they're, that everything they do is perceived as criminal, that they're criminalized for everything. And kind of, if you would, like, what kinds of things would um, these young people be criminalized for other than drug use or drug selling? That's a great question. Um, 
I think, yeah, so I think if we look at the community that's over-policed around drugs, and, and I have to say that drugs is the major form of oppression just because it's so easy, it's smell of cannabis. Um, that's the driver for most of those stops and searches. Um, so it does make up the lion's share, but you can see it in other things as well, the antisocial behaviour orders mm. that we saw um, that, that exploded in the noughties under the Labour government and continued in the 2014 legislation. You know, so that is largely applied to communities living in deprivation, particularly um, high levels of racial disparity in the application of those orders. So, and again, those are easier tools to use because the thresholds are so much lower. And you'll get things like a gang being defined as three kids hanging out with each other. You know, so that's then civil injunctions come in. So it's all of these different kind of, um, but those are, those are slightly more complicated to use than the drugs stop and searches. Um, so yeah, you may, I, I think we talk about all the time about how what happens to the communities we work with is nothing to do with drugs. It's to do with social deprivation. It's to do with you know, lack of trust in the state. Like One of the things we brought out in the first paper we did in racial disparity in 2014 around why police officers should care about the overuse, the over-policing of communities is because that lack of trust and legitimacy I think, and we, well, there's evidence from this in the US, it's called self-help violence, where communities take on, take on problems that they're experiencing into their own hands and respond using their own actions and their own tools because they don't trust the state to support them in that. And so in our view, actually the over-policing is contributing to youth violence. You know, that, that sense of, 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 of being separate from the state, of not having the state there to support you, whether that be through policing or school exclusions, which is another element of it. And so therefore, when problems happen, when beef happens, that ha that's dealt with by those individuals because there is nothing around them to support them. So in fact, the state is causing harm to itself constantly by, by engaging in this. Yeah, and it's also interesting in drug policy reform, the idea of the state as a benign actor as well. You know, everybody's like, the state will solve the problem, but often the state is one of the actors that are responsible for the violence, yeah. Which actually reminds me of a great anthropological work by Didier Fassan, uh, uh, The Force of Order. And he was basically doing ethnographic research in, in, the, in, par in Parisian suburbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, he had access to the pol a police unit that basically was in charge of security and public order in, in you know, Paris and suburbs, mostly populated by uh, migrants, oh, not migrants, but French people of migrant origins, or second, third, fourth generations. Uh, and the more they enforced the order, they called order, <laughs> the more there was escalation of violence. And that's very much connected, I think, to what you argued in a way in your paper, which is this sort of disruption in the trust between local communities and the, the sort of face of the state, which brings uh, the pursuit of alternative forms of, you know, sort of organization, which increases then confrontation and then takes it to an escalation level often. It also reminds me that, you know, the, the workings of public authority, especially in the case of the police, I'm not sure in the UK, but, you know, in my case studies, for instance, in Iran, in France, as well, uh, and of course in the US, uh, there's a politics of numbers. And that means the police needs to arrest a number of people. Mm -hmm. That's the target. And if you don't do that, it means that you're not doing the job because crime is always out there mm -hmm. and, you know, and you have to tackle it. Of course in Iran, that means that, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that you need to be a drug user to be arrested under drug offenses. You just need to look like one, mm -hmm. which often means uh, poor people, of course, poor people, homeless people. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who m may just look a bit alternative from the sort of uh, orthodox aesthetics, mm -hmm. of, particularly in Iran, I would say, you know, given you know, how things are going, uh, and many other sort of implications. How drug policy can be used for many other ends, actually, other than controlling even drugs and people who use drugs, you know, and political ends. Any other question? Sort of triggered by this internal discussion within the panel. It's your last opportunity to ask a question about the everyday for today. <laughs> yeah, that worked. It's a kind of a life history question. I'm a trip to the UK rather than the, the worldwide, but how would you like 
and sources to deal with drugs, drug panache. Would you like to start, yeah, me? I start think you that. probably have the most energetic response. Yeah, um, so I think the first thing I'd like to see is decriminalization. So I think that the fact, so often, because we, we do a lot of work with in, in policing environments, so we're external advisors to the Her Majesty's Inspector on Constabulary, we've, we've worked with College of Policing, we've worked with um, the Home Office and Stop and Search parts. Um, and often police officers will say to me, it's the law, we have to enforce it. And I understand that. But there are choices that be, are being made by police officers. So, for example, the 70% figure that I mentioned of drug searches. I mean, most communities are concerned about violent crime and property crime. Um, and what I would like to see, first of all, is that we move towards a decriminalization model where police just aren't policing personal use. Um, and I don't think that is that out there when we've got the Psychoactive Substances Act and we have several countries across the world that have adopted that approach. I think that is not a difficult thing for police to manage. I think police can also distinguish between supply and between um, drug possession. They have the skills to do that. Um, equally, you know, I don't want to see people who supply drugs thrown under the bus. I mean, there are people who are very violent in the trade and you know, need to be dealt with, but there are people who are violent in lots of legal markets as well. Um, but I think the first thing we need to do is to stop um, policing possession of drugs. That would be my answer to that. And I think there are levers that you could put in to deprioritize policing, but my answer would be I'd want to see the decriminalization. Other panel members? Me? Oh, yeah. But, but, um Yes, it, quite a tricky, tricky question to to answer. I suppose uh, apart from you know following on from from Lee's re reply, which I think I think that it does capture a lot. I think uh, often there's quite a lot of uh, missed opportunities as well. Perhaps in certainly y you know thinking in, in relation to a substance like cat, which was was banned in the UK in in 20, 2014. I must uh, you know say as well that did come from a lot of pressure from within. Um, especially from within the Somali community to uh, push towards um, the, the ban of it. So, so it's, it, you know, quite, quite um, um, you, you know, there were, were a lot of community concerns about, about CAT, which, which that certainly reflected. Um, but I think, you know, in some ways, like, for example, the, the prohibition of that, and it's an interesting question. I have not seen any, any hard and fast statistics on, on how much um, enforcement there actually is of uh, the CAT ban uh, nowadays, I think that those kind of figures get yeah uh, get very much uh, tied up with broader figures, and it's really hard to disaggregate how much actual policing. But I think probably probably very very little on the on the whole. But it did seem that that was a good opportunity, and the way you know people you know trying to put a bit of advice out there uh, for what the what the policy could be towards cat, you know, pushing to um, y you know thinking of so, sort of some forms of community protection and things like that that could come in you know may maybe maintaining cat as a legal thing because cat was being taxed at the at the time it was banned so you know i think there were alternatives around you know perhaps what money being uh, tax money revenue coming in from cat how that could have been used for some community support so maybe there were alternatives and it did it seemed to me a bit of a op missed opportunity and i think the government just in relation to cat just kicked it into the, the long grass really by um uh, by banning it here, you know, rather than thinking of um, some, you know, alternatives that might have, um, pa you know, perhaps been a good chance to explore different models of um, a drug policy. So, thank you. I don't, I don't know that I can speak very directly to that question, but I would just say that, like, from the perspective, for example, of farmers in Colombia, I think we would need to build a link between regulation and decriminalization within the UK and then what happens to producers in the global south, be it in Afghanistan or Myanmar in the case of opium um, and in the case of Colombia with coke and cocaine. Um, and just to ensure that when, I, I mean, my sense is that we are slowly, very, very slowly going towards decriminalization and regulation, which personally I think is the direction we need to go but that the risk in the case of producer, producing countries and producer, for producers is the loss of their livelihoods 
due to a positive step towards regulation. So I guess I just would think about the connection between the two, which, yeah, and I think that's a, I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, I think that the three answers covered a lot of ground. I'll just add perhaps, and I agree with everything you all said, and I would add that perhaps in sort of in thinking globally rather than simply on the UK, and because uh, the question of uh, production, from production to consumption, really, uh, economies all across and livelihood all across the world are affected. Uh, and, and it... And, and of course, it means that if we are going to accept uh, progressively uh, certain substances as legal, we need to make sure that the, the distribution of these profits are not uh, sort of bought up or sort of in, by you know large corporate interests or large pharmaceutical companies, for instance, which is the case, for instance, which is happening somehow with cannabis. It may happen with something that's not produced on a large scale, but it's quite profitable, which is psychedelics, for instance. Yeah. Nowadays, uh, pharmaceuticals have great, great interest in this. And we see a lot of advertisement around. I mean, it says advertisement, but also information sharing of, of a positive kind, uh, which is great, but also it shows that there is interest. Uh, economic interest behind it. Whereas for substances that are not uh, at the moment under this realm, like opium, opiates, or such, that's completely banned. And you know, I think we need to reflect upon sort of how to make this quite equitable. And of course, that runs against the interest of making it regulated. And so there must be a political decision to do so because, you know, uh, in the end, if, if that's not done, we, we, we're going to affect, as uh, uh, Francis said, livelihoods, and, and affecting that means a lot of other problems, which, you know, the regions we studied have been suffering from, I mean, for decades now. Yeah, exactly. Of course. So, yeah, and I think that those models that we're seeing in the U.S. around social equity for cannabis in states like New York um, and in Massachusetts, which are really pushing for priority licenses for people who've been over-policed and who have been incarcerated, um, providing technical and financial systems. And I think these are that these are happening in real life. They are giving us real world evidence of how it could work. So I don't think it is this kind of, um, I, I suppose, you know, more more socialist approach to, to economics. I, I think what we're seeing is a real shift to recognizing the damage and, and looking at transitional economies that bring people in who have been harmed and who need that income. So that, that I think there are positives around that space. Yeah, absolutely. And and education, 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 which is the key to to uh, to using anything, including food. Um, anyway, any other question? Please, on the, uh, would you mind waiting for the microphone if you have audience online? Thanks a lot for for Neil. Um, could you just, well, there's going to be two questions. Uh, firstly, just on consumption of cat um, in terms of how much is used generally, if there's a sort of range um, on a daily or weekly basis. And then secondly, um, you just mentioned about pressure from the Somali community uh, on the law bring it being brought in in 2014. Is it all right just to expand on what you mean by the Somali community and what the pressure was and perhaps why that came about? Please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, as, as I sort of mentioned in the in the paper and the presentation. You know how much is consumed. Um, it does vary a lot. <clears throat> so you do get a lot of consumption that is more kind of weekend. Uh, weekend. This is more thinking of uh, of the Kenyan Kenyan case here. So you, you do get a lot of consumption that is more. You, you know, the weekend. A lot of people. There's a, a nice Swahili joke uh, that uh, Saturday is Saga Day, and Saga means to grind. So you know cat is consumed by chewing it. So uh, kusaga, saga, comes to be a, a, a way of uh, jokingly referring to consuming cat. And uh, saga day, you know, Saturday, saga day. So there is that joke that, you know, the weekend, that's when you chew kind of um, uh, kind of thing. But then there is, is that, um, and that often might be, you know, people, uh, uh, you, you know, consuming like a, a bundle or two over, over a night. But then there is this other, where, where you do get like a lot of the, the traders who consume, who probably would, you know, more like, uh, you know, you'd get up, you'd, you'd have your breakfast, then you'd chew a little bit, then you'd have your lunch, you'd chew a little bit more. So a lot more of a, 
sorry, just to interrupt. Yeah. It's right to go into what a bundle might consist of in terms of weight. Yes, uh, well, ha- yes, it, it's kind of um, a bit how long's a piece of string in some ways. Um, so you get different sizes. They, they tend to call it a, a kg. K- it comes to be like, oh, I'll get, you know, like a re- referring to a bundle, but it doesn't actually like link to a, a kilogram in weight. So a, a typical cat bundle, which probably would do someone for one session, would um, within it, it would have about like 30, 30 or so stems. Uh, um, you know, picked from the tree. That would be a, a typical, a typical bundle, which would probably be about a typical, um, it, you know, especially more social recreational chew. That would be quite typical. Um, but like I say, there, there's other ways of chewing it. So the, the t- way traders chew it might be, you know, just a, a few stems um, in between your meals or this kind of thing. So, so it's, it's kind of hard to to say uh, hard and fast how much uh, people uh, people might consume. And you do get a lot of uh, judgments about how much people should consume, you know, or how much is excessive. But it's not necessarily about the bundle, actually, or the quantity of cat. It's about how long you spend chewing. So that's when I think more people would see problematic consumption to be, you know, someone's um, uh, not sleeping enough. That tends to be the, the main, you know, the main gauge of someone who's chewing too much. Not necessarily the quantity they're chewing, but how much time and how, how little sleep they might be getting. Because uh, yeah, that that would probably be the um, uh, the way people would would kind of make an estimation or a value judgment on whether someone is chewing too much or not. And in terms of that, yeah, I mean, it was um, yeah yeah the, the <coughs> a lot of the the key figures uh, calling for cat to be banned in the UK. It's ca- kind of a very long story and goes back to uh, y- you know certainly in, in by the 1990s, you know when the UK the population of Somali uh, the Somali population in the UK was growing you know, as a result of um, uh, the civil war and people coming as refugees and, and so forth. And that real, real expansion of the Somali diaspora um, did, did lead to, because, you know, qu- quite a, there is quite a proportion of Somalis who do choose. So that did uh, cause more and more demand in the UK for uh, cat to, uh, to be imported from places like Kenya. So from the 1990s within the UK and, and elsewhere, you know, in the States and elsewhere, it, di- it did grow in the quantities that were being I- imported. Um, but it, it, did, it did become a key, key source of uh, concern for a lot of, um, a lot of, within the Somali community, like a lot of concern, uh, especially around, uh, around things like, uh, you know, childcare, uh, the, there was um, a, lo- a lot of talk like, that, um, you know, w- uh, the pressures on, in particular on women would, would grow greater, you know, if it, within like the Somali diaspora context where perhaps there's not the extended family who might have given support with uh, childcare, for example, as might have been the case back in, in Somalia or in other, other Somali parts of the Somali regions. Um, but then the pressure, it, it became more of a nuclear family kind of uh, context. And then if as part of that, if the men were spending a lot of time away chewing and not contributing to childcare. So there's quite a lot of inter, inter-family uh, tension, I think, which arose, you know, around those kind of, uh, those kind of um, aspects of, um, of uh, life. Which now, now having kids, I do uh, probably, I think I always understood that kind of argument, but having kids now... I think I really, <laughs> I really feel that kind of argument more than more than I did. But there was a lot of calls as well that cat was being linked to, you know, rates of unemployment, um, and these these kind of things were, um, and and also like the family family income. You know, if people were spending a lot of that, you know, family incomes weren't great, and that was being spent on on cat, and not just in the UK, but more widely in the, uh, amongst the Somalis. I think there's a, a lot of a lot of ideas that you know just spending. M- um, just spending money on cat, you know, it is kind of wasting it in a way. And this, uh, and certainly this idea, like if you are in the Somali diaspora, there's kind of a lot of, quite a lot of pressure to send remittances back to the Somali regions. So if instead of kind of, um, uh, instead of contributing to those wider family obligations, if, you know, if your money is just being spent on cat, there was quite a lot of, uh, you know, regarding that as a, not a good thing to uh, to be doing. So, um, and also, Islam did come into it a, a bit with, uh, you know, cats always had a very ambiguous uh, relation w- and view, um, y- you know, within Islam as well. So, so uh, there, there was that kind of moral uh, validation of it going on as well. But yeah, lo- a lot of concerns around things like, uh, you know, family disputes and um, unemployment. So the, these were kind of the key things that, that people were bringing out. 
you know, and the key reason a lot of Somalis um, really were calling for uh, for cat to be banned. And also this feeling that if cat was something that was being consumed by the wider UK society, there was definitely a sense that it, the UK government would have been would have banned it a lot qu more quickly. So uh, there, there was an argument that the it, it showed that the UK government wasn't taking Somali seriously because it wasn't banning it. So th this did become a become an argument as well. So, but yeah, there was a, there was a lot going on in that in that push amongst Somalis themselves. I think to um, uh, you know calls for cat to be to be banned. But thank you, thank you, Neil. Which makes me think as well how much easier it is to ask governments to ban things than to allow them. And governments have a tendency in general. I look like a very much neoliberal kind of mindset in what I said, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, I just hurt myself. Like. Oh, just one more point on that. There, there was kind of maybe that intergovernment thing, but you could see the logic. Like when you look at the history of where cat has been banned around the world, <clears throat> you know, in places like the US, like cat was banned in places like that way before, you know, it was kind of the, you know, there was much of a cat, com um, cat consuming community within the US. But it, it, a lot of it did seem to have been just this logic. You know, like, country X had banned this substance, therefore it must be bad, therefore we should ban it as well. And it did seem to take on that sort of momentum. And you could see it as, you know, more and more European countries banned it without actually doing much in the way of research to see whether it was, you know, responsible for these harms. But there was this relentless logic. It's banned there, therefore it must be. And like you say, yeah, I think there's... It's a lot easier to go that direction than to go the other way, isn't it? But and the imitation sort of game doesn't work on the other way. So yes. if someone in a sort of, you know, sort of regulates a substance, it's not as easy to regulate it you know, elsewhere. And that's clearly visible with what's happening across, even across Europe within debates, for instance, for cannabis in Germany uh, being regulated probably soon and while the Italian government is doing exactly the opposite quite along the lines of the UK government probably. Anyway, any other questions? No, we are, oh yeah, signs that we are uh, running out of time, two hours, uh, but you know, we're still here. Thank you very much and I just uh, please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs> thank you and the discussion, thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you for having uh, oh, reception, uh, because, you know, uh, you cannot have a drug event without uh, intoxicants. Please follow the exit uh, lights and, you know, we'll have a good time. The reception's out.